This week on The Record, Border Wars. Missouri Governor Mike Parson sends the National Guard to Texas to install barbed wire. The Supreme Court says Border Patrol can cut that wire down. And Republicans balk at how much Governor Jimmy Pritzker wants Illinois to spend on health care for migrants. Donald Trump endorses a candidate in the closely watched primary battle between Mike Bost and Darren Bailey. Missouri prepares for the presidential caucus. Could Illinois force industries to open their books and reveal their payments to lobbyists? Secretary of State Alexi Janoulias is on the record. It's all coming up right now. Welcome to The Record, I'm Mark Maxwell. We begin with a new push to shine a light of transparency on corporate efforts to lobby Illinois politicians. We sat down Wednesday with Secretary of State Alexi Janoulias. What's the problem that you're trying to fix with this lobbying reform proposal? People have lost trust in government. People in Illinois are sick and tired of being a laughingstock. They're sick and tired of uh, corruption, ethics abuses, people going to jail and reading crappy headlines and we think it's incumbent on all of us as elected officials to do whatever we can to help restore trust in government. We see it with people who don't want to vote, people who distrust their leaders, people who hate the political process and as the office that's in charge of lobbyist registration we feel that it's time for us to step up and do more. Illinois transparency laws do require some form of disclosure. For example we know which lobbyists are working on behalf of which entities or companies and we often know through campaign finance disclosures which companies are showering which politicians in their campaigns with, with money. But until now, we haven't been able to see how much the companies are paying the lobbyists. What would that tell us if we could see that number? Well, we want to see where the influence is. We want to see how much these corporations uh, are paying people to lobby on their behalf. We want to see where the influence comes from, how much influence is be, being exerted, where and how. Also, you know, we have reporting um, safeguards and we are responsible for that, but we've never really had true enforcement mechanisms. So what we're looking for now is to be able to go after the bad actors. How do you think lobbyists are going to feel about this? And I'll ask the question this way, because some companies take lobbying out of it. They don't like to show trade secrets. They don't like to show how much they pay for a certain product. If you force them to show that money, I mean, isn't that going to jam up the works a bit? Uh, I don't think so. I think look, my, my feeling, and maybe I'm naive and a little idealistic, I, my opinion is, and the conversations I've had is, if you are a lobbyist who are, who's doing things the right way, if you're an elected official who's doing it the right way, you should look forward to transparency. You should look forward uh, to a clear process where there's uh, transparency and we do things to safeguard any uh, ethical abuses. I think the ones who are going to be upset about it are the ones who uh, potentially are in that gray area. If you saw the, the list of payments from industries and companies to lobbyists. And you saw one number that just jumped off the page. It was way higher than the rest of the lobbyists were getting paid. What would that tell you? What would that indicate? And, and by the way, let me be clear. It's okay for companies to spend whatever they think is necessary. We're not saying, you know, you can't uh, lobby, you can't influence. What we're saying is let the public know what that, how much that influence is and what its impact is. I think that's completely fair. Right, but if you think that's important, information for the public to see, surely you must think there's a reason. Uh, I think that's up to the public to determine based on the information that we can give them. There's only so much we can do in the Secretary of State's office. So again, we will continue to report. We want to have enforcement mechanisms for those who um, violate the lobbyist uh, law and the ethics laws. And anything we can do, especially now, to increase transparency and to rebuild trust uh, could not be more important. You have a big office. A lot of power comes with it, a lot of responsibility comes with it, but you don't have a vote in the House or the Senate. You have to rely on partnerships there from the leadership and from others. And from the reports I've read, it doesn't look like they're necessarily as committed to this idea as you are. Can you guarantee that this bill is going to get across the finish line this year? I can guarantee that I'm going to do everything I can to get this bill passed. There's only so much we can do. Uh, I feel confident uh, that it will get passed. Um, but I think it's going to take a lot of work. And again, I think the fact that we have to put a lot of work into it is incredibly disheartening. It adds to how people feel about the political process. Uh, and, you know, people complain about their elected officials. They complain about who's in charge. This is our chance as elected officials to, do, uh, to play a small role in, in helping to clean things up. 
when you came into office, uh, the if you wanted to go and look see who's lobbying whom, you'd have to go and search by each name and then punch up a PDF and anyone trying to search data or compare things, you'd have to do a lot of legwork, which is fine. I mean, we'll put the work in as reporters to find that information, but I mean, how clean, you've talked about modernizing government. When I say clean data, how presentable is this gonna be when, when you're done shining up this new database I think you're trying to put together about lobbying? What are we gonna see? What's the end result? So again, the entire reason that I ran for office and my priority for this office has been to bring new technology, to modernize it, to set, take us out of the Stone Age. That includes lobbyist registration, includes business services, it includes vehicle and driver services. Uh, so yes, things will be cleaner, they'll be easier to access, there'll be a lot more efficiencies, and we're going to do everything we can to eliminate the time tax that people need um, just to access simple government services, including doing research on uh, certain lobbyists. Do you think we would have been, if we knew how much ComEd was paying Mike McLean, would it have stopped anything? I can't speak uh, to that. I, I think in general, where there is transparency, where people know how much money is being spent on whom, I like to think that there's less of a chance for some of these bad actors to do what they did. Got to ask you a political question. It's a presidential election year. President Biden promised to be a bridge to the next generation. I think you'd say you're a part of that next generation. Do you want to see him run for re-election? Is he, is he someone that can lead this party, or is it time for him to pass the baton to the next generation? Well, let me work backwards. I, I fundamentally think uh, that Donald Trump uh, represent a, represents a very real, very real threat to our democracy. Uh, it's, he's someone whose values don't represent mine as a human being, as someone who's the father of three daughters. Uh, it disturbs me that uh, someone like that can get away with the way he acts and think he should be the most powerful person in the world. Do I wish Joe Biden was younger? Yes. So would you feel that way about Nikki Haley? About Nikki All Haley. the things you just said about Donald Trump, would you feel that way about Nikki Haley? Because we don't know who the nominee, we, we presume it will be uh, so, Trump. So uh, Donald Trump to me is reprehensible uh, as a person and based on people who know him and people who work with him and people who've worked under him, none of them want him in office. I think that says something. Uh, Nikki Haley, I fundamentally disagree with almost all of her policy positions, but to me, she's not someone that I would turn the TV off if my daughters were watching. I guess why risk it with, with Joe Biden at this point? Well, I can't speak to the you know, political calculations that Joe Biden's team uh, are making. I will tell you, based on what I've heard, he fundamentally believes that he's the only one that can keep Donald Trump from being elected. Do you agree with I'm him? I'm not smart enough uh, you know, to know the, 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 the national landscape on what that looks like. You don't think there's another Democrat out there who could beat Donald Trump? Uh, I think, I like to think there is. Um, to me, the fact that it's a close race, polling-wise, uh, is scary as is. Yeah, you've seen the polling. I guess that's what I'm driving at, is that some of the polls show Donald Trump right now ahead of Joe Biden in several key swing states. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's still early. And I will also tell you, I, I do think, regardless of how you, what political party you uh, are in, Don, Joe Biden does not get enough credit for the success of our economy, for some of the things he's been, he's been able to do on, on infrastructure, things, issues that I care about, like the environment. I think his work on uh, making sure we got through uh, COVID after the failure of the previous administration uh, are laudable, and I think history will judge him very kindly. Um, and I think if there's a way that he could get more credit for his presidency, I do think his poll numbers would be higher. You heard the speech from Governor Pritzker taking swipes at Governor Abbott, at Donald Trump. He'll be in Nevada Saturday campaigning to rally for expanding abortion access. That's a big presidential swing state. What kind of a president would J.B. Pritzker make? I think he'd be a great president. I think he's done a great job uh, in Illinois. I think he's uh, included some very important programs. I think he's done it in a way that's balanced the budget. I think he's been um, fiscally responsible. I think he's had to de deal with a lot of huge challenges, not just the migrant crisis. He was the governor throughout all of COVID. And I think he's been a great leader. And I'm not saying that as a fellow Democrat. I think he's done a great job. I've been in this, in this building for a long time. He's done a great job. All right, thanks for, our er, for your time. Thank you. Border wars start to blow holes in state budgets. How Missouri and Illinois are spending millions to bar or shelter migrants next.
At long last, inflation is cooling off for most American shoppers, except at the grocery store, where stubborn high prices persist. Soon, Illinois could abolish that grocery tax. Let's permanently eliminate the grocery tax. It's one more regressive tax that we just don't need. If it reduces inflation for families from 4 to 3 percent, even if it only puts a few hundred bucks back in families' pockets, it's the right thing to do. That was one of a few proposals from Governor J.B. Pritzker, drawing applause from both sides of the aisle. Senate Republicans said Pritzker was taking a page out of their book. Governor Pritzker is finally following our lead. So Senate Republicans have proposed several years in a row that we eliminate the grocery tax that I think is just a punitive tax on working families. Pritzker's plan may save a penny on every dollar you spend at the grocery store. Senator Plummer suggested the governor was playing a bit of sleight of hand, raising taxes through a backdoor method of reducing that standard tax deduction you can claim at the end of every year. He just the individual income tax standard deduction to 25 for the tax year 2024 down to 2550. That would have been 2775. So any family that makes less than half a million dollars, that right there, that standard deduction impacts them. So that's a tax increase of every family making less than a half a million dollars. Pritzker's budget proposal would revise the state tax code to collect more in taxes from some of the biggest retail stores in the state, sports books, and from corporations declaring a net operating loss carryover from year to year. In addition to revising the state's tax code to collect more money, Pritzker is proposing several major changes on the other side of the state's ledger sheet, too, the spending side. For example, Pritzker's $52.7 billion budget proposal would make a sizable investment in quantum computing, semiconductor research and development, homeless shelters, and more than half a billion combined on health care and shelter for undocumented adults and asylum seekers. Do you think that immigration issue impacts people in the Metro East? We probably are not seeing as many immigrants in our community as Chicago is seeing, but as a state that will impact us, we have to look at it as, as a whole entire state because um, that the, the budget is a statewide issue. When we have citizens of Illinois who are making jokes about, I'm going to cross the border and walk back in because I'll get better health care, we should stop and pay attention. Pritzker anticipated he'd likely face Republican criticism for his plan to shelter asylum seekers or spend state money to provide health insurance for undocumented migrant adults. I am sure that when I leave the podium today, there will be some who will walk outside this chamber looking for a microphone so they can start yelling about sanctuary cities and immigrants taking our tax dollars. Indeed, Illinois could have tapped into millions of federal dollars to cover those expenses if the House and Senate had just approved that bipartisan immigration plan. But Pritzker blamed congressional Republicans for caving to Donald Trump's demands and walking away from that deal. But he laid this charge at President Biden's feet. States and cities in the country's interior are not equipped alone to handle the rapid influx of new arrivals that we have seen. The White House and the federal government need to step up to coordinate and manage these asylum seekers when they cross the border. And they shouldn't leave it to the governor of Texas, who has no goal but to sow chaos and destruction. Brisker claimed Texas Governor Greg Abbott was holding the nation hostage over this immigration issue. While Pritzker is pushing to spend tax money, building out shelter and supports for migrants bust to Illinois, Missouri Governor Mike Parson is issuing an executive order to spend tax money, trying to barricade that border with razor barbed wire. Parson is sending 200 National Guard troops to Texas on a mission one month after the U.S. Supreme Court said those Border Patrol agents there can take down razor wire Texas was already putting up. Parson illustrated the deadly impact fentanyl has had in Missouri, claiming the cartel's drug trafficking at the border was responsible for the deaths of 63 Missouri kids last year. We still have people dying from fentanyl. We still have people being trafficked. We still have nearly 2 million people who have not only entered this country illegally, but gotten away under the Biden administration. And it's all because of the non-existent security between ports of entry. More than a dozen other red states are pitching in resources to assist Texas in that Operation Lone Star. The deployment will cost Missouri taxpayers $2.3 million. Southern Illinois is deep red Trump country, who the former president is backing in a bitter primary battle for Congress. Mm -hmm. 
Signs of a breakthrough of a state house stalemate. Missouri Republicans advanced two rival plans to make it harder to change the state constitution this week. A house proposal would require ballot drives to start over gathering signatures once again if the courts had to alter the content or the title of that ballot measure. It would also require people passing petitions to have lived in Missouri for at least 30 days before they start circulating paperwork to gather signatures. A separate Senate proposal would add a much higher hurdle, both a simple majority statewide and a second layer, a simple majority in five of the state's eight congressional districts as well. Conservative Republicans said that strategy would empower rural regions of the state over larger population centers. When you break it all down, the Missouri Independence analysis found it would only require as few as 23 percent of voters statewide to stop a constitutional ballot drive. In Illinois, Congressman Mike Boss picked up a coveted endorsement this week. Former President Donald Trump says he backs Boss' bid to return to Congress for a sixth term, delivering a stinging blow to Darren Bailey, who's challenging Boss for his seat. Both men have firmly embraced the former president, but Trump says Boss was one of the first House committee chairmen to support his campaign, and he took notice. Illinois votes in the primary Tuesday, March 19. Early voting is already open. In mid-Missouri, the field of candidates running to replace Congressman Blaine Luttkemeyer on the Hill is growing. Luttkemeyer recently announced his plans to retire at the end of this year. This week, a Republican from Boone County jumped in. Taylor Burks, the former Boone County clerk, says he's seeking that Republican nod for the third Missouri congressional seat in that district there. State Senator Mary Elizabeth Coleman and former State Senator Bob Onder also in the running. The seat represents Jefferson City and some parts of the St. Louis region. We're a little less than a week away from the Missouri caucuses. For the 2024 presidential primaries, Missouri's GOP will hold in-person caucuses instead of voting in a more traditional, typical ballot box. You have to show up to the county's caucus site in order to participate and pick who you want as the Republican nominee for president. We'll have expanded coverage of the Missouri caucuses this Saturday and on next week's episode of The Record. We go back to Illinois for Governor Pritzker's sixth budget address in the state of the state. Why he quoted a hundred-year-old speech from a Ku Klux Klan rally next. Let's face it, if you've watched politics very closely the last decade or so, you might feel like you've seen it all. But every once in a while, something can still surprise you, at least for a moment. I admit that was the case for me covering Governor J.B. Pritzker's sixth budget address on Wednesday. The Democratic governor often talks about his family's heritage as Ukrainian Jews, refugees who resettled here in America, who fled violent anti-Semitic attacks in Europe in the late 19th century. So naturally, you wouldn't expect a politician with that background to quote directly from a Ku Klux Klan rally in the Deep South. I would build a wall of steel, a wall as high as heaven, against the admission of a single one of those Southern Europeans who never thought the thoughts or spoke the language of a democracy in their lives. Those words were spoken a hundred years ago by Georgia Governor Clifford Walker at a Ku Klux Klan rally. But the reality is, it could have been a social media post by Donald Trump last week. Time might march forward, but our society's worst impulses seem never to go away. Pritzker trying to make a political point there. We checked the record, and yes, that Georgia governor did say that in 1924. But truth is, that instinct, that impulse, has been around for thousands of years. Societies have been building walls and hiding behind them in search of safety, preservation of power, or sorting through ideology or identity somehow. Other, more recent examples have existed, too. Former Republican presidential nominee Mitt Romney called for a border fence when he ran for president in 2012. Before that, President George Bush signed the Secure Fence Act of 2006. And get this, Senators Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, they voted for it. In this big election year, politicians will use powerful symbols to stoke passions. And that kind of rhetoric can often persuade people to think differently about a topic. Fair game. But in a functioning democracy, those powerful motivators like outrage or fear are only as good as the destination to which they lead you. If we only ever end up in disgust at those with whom we disagree, then what have we accomplished after all? Medieval warfare taught us high walls are no defense against burning from the inside out. Fiery passions can turn fellow countrymen after, uh, against one, one another. Abraham Lincoln suggested that another ingredient to buttress the national defense back in 1838. He said this, passion has helped us, but can do so no more. It will in the future be our enemy, reason. Cold, calculating, unimpassioned reason must furnish all the materials for our future support and defense. That does it for us. Thanks for watching. We're going to be back here at the same time again next week. Until then, 
we're off the record.